Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. Okay, bismillah. So very happy to be back with you all. I hope you guys had a great summer. How was your summer? Great. No. You're ready for fall. Huh? Especially today, we're ready for fall. You're ready for fall? Why? Because it's so, so hot, yeah. Hot. But it wasn't, I mean, it's been a little nice though the last week. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's a great wave. Just being so, ungrateful. Hmm? Just being ungrateful. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I do remember it was a, it was a bit humid today. Um, so, yeah, so... The series that we have, we're going to start with today, is called Awaken and Transform. And these are two um, action steps or two ingredients that we need to really uh, renew our lives and benefit and bear the fruits, the spiritual, mental, and emotional fruits from you know our path in life, right? It's we need to awaken and, and so that we can transform. And I'm going to break that down a little bit today. So the first, where I want to start is with the word awaken, right? What does awakening mean when I say awaken? What comes to your mind? If I asked you, define awakening for me, what would you say? Change. Change, okay. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, essentially, what were you going to say? Change? Like a shift. And shift, okay, I like the word shift. Okay, so change, shift. When you think of awakening, you think of a change, shift. But how about just the word awake? What do you think of? Alert. Alert, okay. Yeah, kind of like alert. Like when you're driving, you know, and... When you're driving. You're not really aware of what's going on. Like you take the same route. So it's like you're aware. Your awareness, right? Yeah, so you change. How about you guys? (laughs) Um, Like being like present I think being present okay okay so the way we usually understand things in our world is through opposites right if I asked you to describe the day you would explain it by understanding the night right and you know how powerful the day is because you know how you know dark the night is right you know that the day comes with sunlight and the day comes with you know action and work and all of these things right and nighttime is more of a settling and you understand things through the turnings right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you from one truth to another and so how do we what's the opposite of being awake asleep right so then to understand being awake we have to understand being asleep what is sleep <laughs> The opposite of everything you just said, right? When you're not aware. So sleep, if you look at the core of sleep, it's essentially a disconnect. Okay? When we are asleep, does the reality around us go away? When you're sleeping in your room, right, does the windows go away? Do the windows go away? Do, does your door go away? Does the blanket go away? Does the, do the people in your house go away? So sleep is not that you are, it's not that the reality doesn't exist anymore, it's that you are disconnected from it. Even subhanAllah, people who sleepwalk, right? They experience, they, they might be walking around the room, they might be doing all of these things, but they are disconnected from it and they often wake up not remembering it. But did that happen? Did those things happen while they were asleep? Absolutely but they were disconnected from it. It's so important to understand this. And many of us don't take the time to really understand the meaning and power of being awakened to our life. Awakened to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awakened to our path, awakened to everything that he has put, as you said, being present, right? 
need to wake up to be present. But many of us are asleep. So sleep, subhanAllah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said sleep is the brother of death. And the people of paradise do not die. SubhanAllah. Now, death, if you think about it, so how are they brothers? Well, death, when you leave this world, you've been, you, you become cut off from it. That's it. It's no longer, it's, no, it's still a reality for others, but not for you. So what we want as Muslims, right, is to wake up before we are awakened. Because in that realm, you're going to be awakened without choice. <laughs> Your, your, the reality becomes very sharp. And so our goal is to live awakened in this world. Meaning that we live with a strong sense of connection to the realities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us about. And many of us are in a state of sleep because we're disconnected from them. They are happening, they are existing. Allah is true, even if we're not dis- even if we're not connected to it. The akhirah is true, even though we're not connected to it. We're asleep, disconnected. <laughs> the message is true, even though we might be disconnected from it. Jannah and Nar is true, even though we might be disconnected from it. Our meeting with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is true, even though we might be disconnected from it. The Quran, Allah's words, are true, even though we might be disconnected from it. It doesn't, it makes sense why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make this dua when he would wake up for tahajjud. And it's such a beautiful dua, and I love to always share it. He would, he would say, and this is a dua that would make him cry, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, he says, Oh Allah, all praise belongs to you. You are the giver of light to the heavens and earth and all who are in them. For you is all praise. You are the caretaker of the heavens and earth and all who are in them. For you is all praise. You are the absolute truth. Your promise is true. Your word is true. Your meeting is true. Heaven and hell is true. The day of judgment is true. The prophets are true. Muhammad is true. O Allah, only to you I submit. Only upon you I rely. Only in you I believe. Only to you I return, only with your help do I debate, only you do I take as a judge, so forgive all that I have done or will do, all that I do openly and secretly, you are the one who puts people ahead and behind, there is none worthy of worship beside you. Here Prophet Muhammad is affirming what is true, (laughs) and he is the most, out of all of us, right, out of mankind, he is the most connected to truth. Yet, when he would wake up in the middle of the night, he would affirm what is true. You know, in, in the world of psychology, and the self-help world, we talk a lot about affirmations and affirming what is true. So that you believe what is true over what is false. So you don't carry within you false messages that aren't true, that aren't who you are, that don't align with your values. So you learn to say affirmations that reflect your truthful values, that reflect who you are, that reflect things that you want to embody. Here, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would get up in the middle of the night, he would affirm what is true, even though he's so connected to those realities. But remembering what is true awakens the soul. Why? Because the soul is not from here. (laughs) This isn't its world. (laughs) It knows it doesn't belong here. It knows it has a home. So every time we remind it of its home, of the realities it witnessed, of the truths that it knows, it becomes awakened. That's the nourishment of the soul. The nourishment of the body is food, water. Nourishment of the soul is Allah's truths, the realities that it was connected to. That is what brings it to life. And you hear people say, you know, I'm living, but I don't feel alive. <laughs> right? And this is the epidemic of today, is that we are living with the most, ad- the most advanced, we're living in a time of the most advanced technologies, right? We are living in a time where, where comfort is 
the highest <laughs> compared to previous generations. Or even people are living in other countries, right? In the West, many people are living with a lot of comfort. Everything has become so accessible, so easy, so fast. <laughs> you know, the second you think of something, within a few minutes it could be knocking on your door deliver being delivered, right? This is what's happening. You think, oh, I need this. You're on Amazon, you get it the next day. We are living in a time where comfort and ease is so accessible. But yet, we're also living in a time where psychological disorders are in, are in an all-time high, where people are struggling more than ever, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, where people are asleep and not awake, where people are surrounded with blessings but they are disconnected from them. And so that's why I intentionally chose the word awaken for this series, because it's not that we don't have access to what serves us. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put exactly what we need to thrive. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made other people's grass greener than ours. It's that we are disconnected from the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in our lives. We are disconnected from the beauty that he has placed within us and outside of us. We are disconnected from his truths. So to transform, you have to awaken. You have to wake up and say, wow, I've been really disconnected. I've been, you know, I've been on cruise control. I've been going, just going through the motions. And this is, this is what I hope to revive within all of us, within myself first and within all of you throughout this series, is that every day you have the opportunity to awaken to your life and to things that you are doing that you've been possibly doing every day but just being disconnected from them. For example, even just walking over here or getting in your car or going to school. Something you do maybe every day. <laughs> But then one day you decide to awaken yourself to it. One day you intentionally walk. You start becoming connected to what is right in front of you. You start becoming more present. That walk becomes different. That drive to work becomes different. That class that you have that day becomes different. And this is the power of our faith. It revives. <laughs> It revives hearts and it shows us that we all have the power to revive even if Allah doesn't add anything new into our life <laughs> externally. There's power in that. That we each have the power to cultivate beautiful homes within even if we're externally going through difficult struggle. Allah gives us this power that this heart has this power to experience great beauties even if outside it's, it's a struggle. And this is something that we're taught. You know, Hassan al-Basri, rahimallah, he says that there's a Jannah here and there's a Jannah in the next world. Those who don't, do not experience it here do not experience it in the next world. So what is he talking? Is he saying that this world is Jannah? No, absolutely not. Not externally, at least. <laughs> this, there is no Jannah externally because this Jannah is perfect and this world is not perfect. But I think what he's opening our hearts to see is that we have the power to cultivate a Jannah within. <laughs> and when we can cultivate that within, then inshallah we can experience the external one in the next world. But cultivating one within means that we stay connected to what serves us. Cultivating a Jannah within internally requires that we stay connected to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says serves us and creates a Jannah within. <laughs> And here's the thing, like, we, many of us spend our lives prioritizing the words of so many people, the teachings of so many people. We might have learned something from our faith over and over again, but then some self-help guru comes along and says, you know, be intentional. We're like, wow, amazing. <laughs> you know, I got to be more intentional. And this is what's happening. It's like, but... So why are we disconnected from what our faith teaches us? And, and that's what it is. It's a disconnect. There's so much beauty that is meant to help us thrive spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, but we're disconnected from it. 
And so our life, one of the foundational hadiths is the, is the hadith on intentions, right? And so we have to revive that. And you will find me repeating a lot of these foundational messages. Why? Because we need constant you know, connection to them. We need to constantly remind ourselves on a daily basis. And you have to do that too. You have to say, you know, how many things did I actually intend today <laughs> or set an intention for today for the sake of Allah? How many things did I connect, like how many times today did I connect what I'm about to do to a value with Allah? Meaning, essentially when you're setting intentions, what are you doing? You're saying, what d value does this hold for me with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this action pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can I align it with Allah? How can I make it pleasing to Allah? Or how, what, are, what are the things that are in this action that are pleasing to Allah and how can I connect to that? So now you're not just walking to school, you're not just driving to work, you're with Allah, you're with Him and you're connected to the fact that you have someone who is ar-raqib, the most watchful over you, that you are never alone and that He is with you and He is, and you know, on a psychological level, we thrive when we know that someone is observing us. <laughs> like we, we, actually, we actually succeed that way. That we're almost programmed, we, they, they've done studies where, you know, they, it's called the audience effect, how people tend to perform better when they know they're being observed. <laughs> so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a human being. Now those observers, right, the human beings, are, they can be flawed. <laughs> They can be even like in industrial psychology, right? Or organizational psychology when they study employee performance. They compare like bad supervision to good supervision and how good supervision makes people thrive and work better, but bad supervision can actually harm a person's ability to thrive and succeed at work, right? But a less supervision is not bad or good, it's the greatest, right? It's the greatest supervision. He's the most merciful, he's the most compassionate. He's observing with a watchful, protective, loving eye, right? And so, Imagine then if you're connected to that in everything that you do. Ya Allah, you see this. Ya Allah, you're aware of this. Ya Allah, you see me going to work. And you know why I'm going to work. You know, you know, you know, and you could even like reaffirm that. All the things that you're trying to achieve. Ya Allah, help me with that. <laughs> Imagine how intentional you walk into that classroom that day. How present you're going to be. It's just little things. You said shift earlier, right? It's the tiniest things that shift can shift your heart completely sometimes. You know, you, you have to try this, especially on the heaviest of days. When you wake up or you're having a really bad day and your heart is so heavy, you don't want to go to school, you don't want to go to work, you don't want to do anything, never underestimate the power of your heart, of Allah shifting your heart, even just a little bit. And you might think when your heart is so heavy, you might think, I can't even imagine how I'm going to get through this day. I can't even imagine how I'm going to feel better. I can't even imagine things getting better. And wallahi, all it takes is a shift. I remember one time I was going to work and it was a very difficult day for me. I felt that you feel that heaviness in your heart. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to start, you know, um, doing shuk, right? Thanking Allah for just anything that is in front of me, anything that I'm that that is in my life right now. Wallahi, within minutes, I found myself smiling. <laughs> That's the power of shuk, shuk. And I thought, wow, here I was thinking that this day was just, you know, <laughs> but this happens to all of us. I'm human, you're human, right? And so, never underestimate. This is this is actually a perfect example of how there could be so much beauty around us but our heart is disconnected from it and we need to revive that connection. So that's what awakening means. It's that you're choosing to no longer, you're choosing to wake up, which means what? You're choosing to no longer be sleep. And what did we say sleep is? A disconnect. Right? When you go to bed at night, you're disconnecting from your world. And sometimes you need that physically. But in a spiritual sense, you need to be awakened. You need to be awakened so you're not disconnected from what you need. You're not disconnected from the truths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on your path. You're not disconnected from what He has put in your life to benefit from. And this is what's happening. People are 
when they're disconnected, they're also disconnected from the things that Allah has put to benefit them. So you cut yourself off from what serves your holistic well-being. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I truly believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everybody not necessarily what they want, but what they need. And this is something that you can practice saying to yourself, that I am exactly where I need to be. Even right now. You might find yourself thinking about, oh, I need to go do this. I'm, maybe I'm wasting time. I need to, after this, I'm going to go do that. Or, you know, thinking about all these things. Tell yourself, no, this is exactly where I need to be. In your life, when you're thinking about all the things you wish you have, or all the next step, or getting to that next phase. No, no, no. Alhamdulillah, I am exactly where I need to be. And Allah has placed in my life exactly what I need. And had he known that thing was good for me, he would have given it to me. <laughs> because he only gives or withholds out of his love and out of what serves us. Just as a parent gives and withholds to their child out of what is best, for, you know, from a place of doing what's best for their child. So to transform, we need to awaken. But then, so again, what do we connect to? What do we awaken to? First and foremost, Allah's truths. Because if you don't wake awake to God's truths, you won't be awakened to anything else. How do we know this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, do not be like those who forgot Allah, He made them forget themselves. So this is why, we can, how can we talk about you know, holistic well-being, or even self-care, or even doing what serves us, if we forget Allah? We're here, where in the Quran, Allah tells us if you forget Allah, He makes you forget yourself. Think about this. Let's break this verse down a little bit, right? What does it mean that He makes you for He He makes you forget yourself? When you forget yourself, what do you essentially forget? <laughs> well, well. No, no, he's saying in, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not be like those who forgot Allah, he makes them forget themselves. So meaning that when you forget Allah, you forget, you forget other things. Huh? Well, you, hmm? well you, you get the product of that is being lost. When you forget yourself, you forget, that's neglect. <laughs> meaning that you forget your needs. You forget what you need to actually thrive in this world. I think this A is so powerful, especially when it comes to healing and growing and thriving. People think, you know, separate. Oh, my healing and my growth and my career success and everything is over here. And then my Dean is like a side hustle. It's what I do, when I, what I fit in when I have the time. But here the ayah says it. Do not be like those who forgot Allah. He made them forget themselves. So yeah, you can be chasing and you can be trying to grow in all these aspects, but you are actually forgetting what you need. And I see this all the time. People thinking they're growing, they're healing. You know what they're doing? They're not actually serving what they need. They're serving their ego and their nafs. They're not actually serving their holistic well-being. They're actually serving the parts of themselves that do not need to grow, such as your lower self. <laughs> When you forget yourself, you forget your higher self. You forget that elevated part of who you are, that soul, that aspect of you that is meant to return to a higher world. <laughs> right? So when we forget Allah, don't ever expect to really truly grow. And if you do think you're growing while you're being disconnected from Allah, be very careful because you're in a direction where it's not really growth. Because how, like, think about this, right? If, if a child, a toddler, <laughs> separated themselves from their mother, would they, wouldn't they be cut off from what they truly need? <laughs> Absolutely. But we need Allah more than this toddler needs their mom. And we forget this. So as we start this series and as we start, you know, renewing, first of all, I encourage you to renew your intentions and say, you know what, we talked to, someone talked to, mentioned fall, the season of fall, and I actually think the season of fall is, um, is so indicative of transformation, you know, and it, it's one of the most beautiful seasons because it reminds my heart all the time of like what the journey of transformation looks like. You see it in the trees, you see how Allah transforms the earth, you see that progression, and it teaches you a lot. 
and so and we'll cover some of those lessons inshallah as we as we continue and hopefully we'll see some foliage all around us <laughs> inshallah but as we begin this series i think it's really important to renew the in, our intentions you know especially when you know now i know it's not uh, maybe the beginning of a new year but allah gives us beginnings in different forms you know whether it's the beginning of a school year for some of you or the beginning or even just a monday <laughs> you know when allah gives you the first day of every week or um, anything, anything, look for opportunities where you say, Ya Allah, you gave me this new beginning. Help me maximize it. Help me awaken. Help me transform. Help me become awakened to everything that you put in my life. Please protect me from being disconnected from what truly serves me. You know. And so we begin by connecting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's truths because, again, if we forget Allah, we forget ourselves. And then we are living in delusion where we think it's, I always mention this example, a lot of you probably heard me say, but it's like chasing a mirage, right? Where you think you see water, you think you see an oasis, and you chase it and you chase it and you're becoming more dehydrated as you chase it because <laughs> you need water. So you obviously don't have water. So the more you exert your energy and your resources, by the time you get to that oasis or that, that you know, um, illusion of an oasis, you're more dehydrated, you've wasted your resources, and then you get nothing in the end. And that's what the path of transformation is, the path of growth is without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a path in which you are wasting your resources. <laughs> and you're not maximizing who you are or actually serving your needs. But above all, you're chasing a destination that offers you nothing. <laughs> so you get there, and this is what happens by the way. People will try to achieve things without a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called them to. And then they achieve one milestone, they get there, they're not sufficed. They're not satisfied. What they thought would make them whole did not make them whole. What they thought would make them nourished did not make them nourished. So let me set another goal. <laughs> let me, you know, set something else that I have to achieve. And they get to that, and they still feel empty. There's a void. That, those goals are like that oasis. <coughs> I run, I run, I run. It's an illusion, right? If I, oh, if I get to that, if I get to that goal, that's what's going to make me at peace. But ala bi dikrillahi tatmainna al right? Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. And so wherever you're at in your life, regardless of how you know big your struggles seem or how far you feel like you've been from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no better time than the present to awaken to, to what Allah has called us to. And, and by doing that, you're going to awaken. I said, so I said the opposite, right? When you forget Allah, you forget what you need. When you remember Allah, your heart finds rest and you also what? Awaken to everything that you need. And you see this in the life of the companions, Rajallahu Anhum, that they were awakened to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in their lives. Why? Because they were very sharply attuned to Allah and His truths. So much so that they maximized their personalities, they maximized their gifts, they maximized who they were, they maximized their service to the world. And that's why hundreds and hundreds of years later, we're still benefiting from their impact. Because they were awakened. They were connected. They did not forget Allah, so Allah did not make them forget themselves. They were awakened to Allah and they remembered Allah, so Allah made them awaken to everything that could help them reach their potential, not only in this earth, but in the heavens, right? So... That's what we want. We want to, Ya Allah, I want to feel like, you know, I'm, I am becoming who you want me to be. I am striving for that potential that you have put within me. And that's what, that's really what we should try to face each day with. And the, the thing that we need most to stay awake is we need to remember that we're not guaranteed another day. The biggest thing that makes people fall into a state of sleep. We talked about awakening, right? The opposite is being asleep. And one of the things is, is that they forget 
that they, they live in a way where they think they're guaranteed tomorrow. And we know from the companions, their example is that they would, spend, they would live the day as if they would not reach the evening, and that they would live the evening as if they would not reach the day. And that itself, and we see, we see this in the lives of so many. Like when people receive, for example, even if they're not like Muslim or religious, right? They'll get a news about they have a chronic illness, for instance, or something. They know they're going to die. Something powerful happens. They become so sharply attuned to their life and how much they've been wasting and what they have been doing and what they have not been doing. And so when we are awakened to the fact that nothing is guaranteed, I'm not entitled to anything. And we live in a time where entitlement is, is at a high, right? We think we're entitled to everything. I'm entitled to constant comfort. I'm entitled to, you know, I'm entitled to tomorrow. I'm entitled to my next breath that I, was, that I don't even own. <laughs> no, we're not entitled to that, right? But to live, this is why I think there are so many harms to entitlement. Because you live with the sense that you own or you're guaranteed things when you're not. <laughs> but when you don't live in an entitled way, even with your own life, where you say, like, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, how can I maximize today? You become so awakened. Not only to Allah's truths, but you become awakened to your power. Really, it's Allah awakens. Remember, if you forget Allah, you forget yourself. But when you remember Allah you, and you awaken to Allah, you also remember and you awaken to yourself and your power because Allah also gave you a power and a responsibility. And you're like, wow, you know, what is in my power today? <laughs> now the reason many people are, you know, drowning in anxiousness and, and, re, and you know, constantly in the future, right, is because they forgot what's in their control. And they're attaching to something that's not in their control. But you know what's so powerful? When you just ask, what is in my power today? What is in my control today? Because shaitan doesn't want you to, to focus on that. Shaitan, he always wants you to be helpless, <laughs> to feel helpless. And if you think about anxiousness, right? People, what is it? It's like you feel helpless. You feel like you're at the mercy of what could happen to you. <laughs> what if, what if, what if, which is not a coincidence that the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to not engage in the what-ifs because they're from shaitan. Shaitan wants you to feel helpless, that you have no power or control. Allah wants you to see your power and control over what he has given you. So all you have to do is say, even today, right? What do I have the power to do today that can awaken me to what Allah has put in front of me to ha that can awaken me to Allah well I have I didn't pray us I have to pray us <laughs> I have Maghrib and Aisha okay those first right I am going in shot I'm gonna set the intention that Ya Allah I want to be as present as I can in these meetings with you I always like to say my meetings with Allah because I you know, sometimes we get so, you, you know, it's Salah, that's what it is. It's your appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so I'm not going to wait till tomorrow because already, it doesn't matter what you say, by the way. You can say, you can claim and say, yeah, I know I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. But it's how you show up through your actions that really affirms the truth of what you claim. So, yes, we can say, we can claim, okay, I know I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. But then when you go to pray, and you pray as if you're not guaranteed another prayer, that's when you really show yourself that you believe what you're saying. Your actions show you the truth of what you believe. Right? And this is why we're always warned of what the opposite, which is in the Quran, of which is hypocrisy. Which is when you what you do is in opposition to what you claim to believe. So show up for what you claim to believe and say, what is in my power to shift today? And Allah is a shakur. You think it's little or tiny in front of Allah to be present in your next prayer? Absolutely not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shakur. He's the most appreciative. He's the more appreciative than any human being. You take one little step towards him, you take an arm's length, as the hadith Qudsi says, you take, you take an arm, um, a hand's length, he takes an arm's length. You go to him walking, he goes to you at speed. 
towards you at speed, right? So he always will come to you closer than you go to him. So that's the thing too. A lot of people are not um, awakened to that reality too, is that that these are truths that Allah has taught us. So when you're disconnected from them, you're disconnected from how powerful it is to even take a small step towards Allah. And you hear this all the time, oh, there's like so little or like, or they think like that it's, it's not going to matter to Allah or that, you know, a good deed is not enough. But to Allah, it's enough. <laughs> to Allah, it's, it's, it's something that He appreciates, something that He values, something that He's going to come closer to you because of. Right? So, awakening to Allah's truths means that we also awaken to these teachings where Allah tells us how close He is to us. As he says in the Quran, if my servant asks you about me, tell them, or he doesn't say tell them, I am near. That's it. <laughs> I am near. Period. Like, there's no in between. And so, this is why Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. Why? Because knowledge awakens you. When you're disconnected from the Quran and Allah's words and then disconnected from what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has taught us then you're disconnected from these powerful truths you need to actually awaken to your life so then when you do things they lack meaning and they lack you know you're not awakened to them because you don't really you're not connected to the reward in them as well and so many times people also might be doing a lot of good but they're asleep as they're doing it why? because they're disconnected from their power we as human beings, we need meaning. And meaning is often, it's called the truth of significance. <laughs> That's what meaning is. It's that value within what you do. And everything in Islam is about giving us value and teaching you that what is the value of what you're doing. You know, so anything, like leaving an argument, there's a reward for that. Your dhikr that you do after prayer, there's a reward for that. So sometimes when people like abandon certain deeds, it's oftentimes because they're disconnected from the reward. They forgot about it. So again, back to the ayah, I'm probably going to repeat this a million times in this um, session, but the ayah is, do not be like those who forgot Allah, He made them forget themselves. So you forget Allah, you forget His truths, you forget His teachings, you forget the rewards that He told you about, then you forget all these things that you actually need to be doing <coughs> that serve who? You, right? Because Allahul Ghani wa Nahnu al Fukara, right? That Allah is the rich, He's not in need, and we are the ones in need. So when we cut ourselves off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cut ourselves off from doing the things that are beneficial for us. This is why people maybe miss out on their morning dhikr, their evening dhikr, their dhikr after prayer, you know, saying sitting and saying subhanAllah thirty three times, Alhamdulillah thirty three times, you know, Allahu Akbar thirty three times. This is so important to just sit with those after every prayer, to not be in a rush to get up after prayer and to just sit still with Allah and to say those athkar while connected to their reward, while connected to their value, while connected to how they are benefiting you. As you say every alhamdulillah, you think of a blessing that is already in your life. Because that's the power of shukr. It's that it awakens you to things that are already in your life that are powerful and beautiful and you've been benefiting from. But now you're not disconnected from them. Now you're not asleep as you're benefiting from them. Now you're connected to them. Right, so seeking knowledge is so important. And this is something that you can say. You can say, you know what? What surah am I going to reconnect with? What's the tafsir of a surah that, let's say, and you can make it realistic. You can say, you know, from now until December, in the, this you know fall slash winter right or beginning of winter let's say fall you I'm going to dedicate myself every day every day to reading a few verses from the surah but reading also the translation and the tafsir and it could literally be two verses <laughs> it doesn't have to be something huge and don't start with big unrealistic goals that you're not going to be able to sustain and you might be, as you're starting, you might feel heavy hearted. You might be like, oh my gosh, I, I feel so far. I don't know how I got my heart to this degree to be so far from Allah. I don't know how, you know, how, how I let all this time pass without opening the Quran. But you know what? You start 
and then your heart becomes a little softer and then you want to continue you start and your heart becomes lighter not as heavy as it was when you first started and then you want to continue and as you continue then you can build and build and build and as you do that you realize you don't and as you do that make sure you think Allah this is huge by the way like you know we always think that shuk or thankfulness is for like external blessings <laughs> or things that we recognize that we like that we like that we have in our life right but it also goes for the things that Allah allows you to do <laughs> So if you had like a beautiful sajda and you felt so close to Allah, afterwards thank Allah. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, be grateful to me, I shall increase you. So gratitude invites abundance. So we should think about this. Then if I want more of these moments with Allah, I want more sujood, like sajdas like this. I want more salahs that are present like this. Then Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to experience this. Why? Because then He will increase you, inshallah. So, and that also shows how much you appreciate these moments with Allah. See, our journey with Allah is rooted in love. Our meetings with Him is about you meeting with your beloved. Your sajda is you being the closest to your beloved. So imagine then if after you have these moments with Allah and you're so close to Allah and you're feeling like you're connecting to your greatest love and you say, Alhamdulillah, thank you for allowing me to have that. Imagine how appreciative Allah will be of you. Imagine how much love He will look at you with. My servant enjoys <laughs> their, like, their meetings with me. My servant enjoys being in that closest position to me. It's not my servant is checking it off. <laughs> It's like an obligation, something, okay, you know, I, I did it. No, my servant actually enjoys it. And you know, it's really interesting because when Allah calls back, nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil soul, right? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irja'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya, right? Not just, oh, tranquil soul, come back to your Lord, radiyatan mardiyya. What does that mean? Pleased, um, sorry, Allah is pleased with, with the servant, but also the servant is pleased with Allah. The servant is pleased with Allah. I am happy that Allah is my Lord. I'm happy to obey my Lord. I'm happy to follow the commands of my Lord. I'm happy to meet my Lord, to go back to my Lord. It's so interesting because we live our life always do what Allah pleases Allah, do what pleases Allah, do what pleases Allah, right? But we forget that Allah loves the one who is also pleased with Him. It's a two-way relationship, subhanAllah. It's not just do this so that, you know, of course we want Allah to be pleased with us. Just as a child wants their parent to be pleased with them. <laughs> you know, psychologically we know that the reason children sometimes lie is because they're trying, they know their parents are, they're in control of their world. <laughs> and they control the security of their world. So they don't lie because they know it's like bad or good. They're not like, you know, evil intention. They, they're just doing it because they know that's what secures their world, their safety, their emotional security. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just Rabb al-Bayt, Lord of the house, right? He's Rabb al-Alameen. And he's the one who secures our entire, sustains life, <laughs> right? And everything in it and everything you know, encompassing of all of it. So, of course, then how can we not want him to be pleased with us? But we also want to cultivate hearts that are pleased with Allah, that have rida. Ya Allah, I am, I am just happy that you're my Lord. I'm happy for everything that you've given me, everything you have withheld. I'm happy that, you know, where you have placed me. I'm happy for what you have, you know, for the blessings in my life. You're just happy to be in a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the kind of soul that Allah calls back. Allah is pleased with it, but we are, he's, uh, we are also pleased with him. And may Allah make us amongst, um, amongst them, inshallah. So I will stop here so I can have some time to take questions, inshallah. Um, we have 10 minutes left. So any, any questions? Just like 
what is your thought on the, you know, the verse you said, um, don't be like those who forgot Allah, mm -hmm. they will, he will make them forget themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, like, it made me think of, um, they say, if Allah loves someone, they give them hardship. Mm. It's kind of the opposite for me, but you can't help me understand both. Okay. What's the opposite for you? Like, if Allah loves someone, he gives them hardship. Yeah. And, and what's the opposite for you? That, the other one you said, if, 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 um, what was it? If he... Don't be like those who forgot Allah. Oh, okay, I get, I get what you're saying. So what's the relation between those two things? Like, you know when you go through hardship, like, is that Allah has, like, I'm forgetting Allah, or mm. is it that Allah loves me, that's why I'm going through this hardship? Well, I think people, I, I think I, and also... I think people get stuck in this, right? This is the common question of like, is my test a punishment or is it a reward? Yeah. You know, I stopped asking that question. I used to, I used to ask that question years ago too, and I had I used to wonder like about that, right? Like, but I actually think it's better to ask different questions when you're going through a test. It's I think it's better to believe in your heart that anything we go through is already automatically rooted in Allah's love for us and for what serves us in this world and the next. I think I just think it's better to not waste our energy assuming that Allah, because that just creates, like it harbors like, and sometimes for people, it could, I've seen this happen to people where they, they have a negative view of Allah, you know, and of course when we go through a test, we can always ask Allah, you know, Ya Allah, please, this is something that, you know, if you are pleased with me, then I, ex I, I accept. And this is what, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said in, in the Dua of Ta'if, right? That all he cared about was that Allah is pleased with him. So, of course, it's natural for any of us to wonder if Allah is pleased with us. But am I going to sit there and keep asking, is this a punishment or is this... No, I'm just going to tell myself, you know, I'm going to assume well of Allah or think well of Allah that he is doing what serves me. And if it is, let's say Allah knows that this test will purify my sins, but then that's not a punishment, <laughs> right? Because I think the way people define punishment too is that like, oh, you did sin, so this is a punishment. No, if you're going through something, a test that purifies you, then it's not a punishment. <laughs> and so we can use our energy, we can choose how to use our energy. And so having an opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we know, you know what, if I'm going through this, it's because he sees in it benefit for me. And then my dua then is not, Ya Allah, are you punishing me or are you rewarding me? My dua is, Ya Allah, help me derive all the benefit of this test. <laughs> help me derive what you want me to derive from this test. Help it be a means of me coming closer to you. And you know, think about this. You know, I think we get stuck because of the, because of the religious language, right? Like, which I think it's important. But I think we need to see beyond it, right? When we think of sins, right? We think of like, there's a lot of, sometimes for a lot of people, there's a lot of shame around that, right? And there's, but think about it. When you, whenever we do anything that goes against our fitrah, our innate truth, our goodness, who we are at our core, which is souls. What does the hadith tell us? When you do, when you do anything that's a, a sin, which is essentially a sin, is anything that goes against the truth of who you are, the truth of how Allah created you, the truth of your path, the goodness, your purity, right? A, a black dot goes on your heart, and then these black dots continue to form. They create like this barrier on your heart, and then we go through a test, and this test shakes us. And only in a test can you really see all the pieces. <laughs> There are things that you will never be able to really assess during times of ease. Things, because in, in, only in difficulty can you really hold on to what is true. Falsehood doesn't help you in times of difficulty. So then, wow, you know, these tests are showing me what I've been carrying. And yes, some, you know, could be effects of our sins, our behaviors, the things that we did that do not serve us. Because that's essentially, when Allah talks about sins in the Quran, He says, those who transgress against themselves, meaning you go against what serves you. That's why I think we need to see beyond the language of just, you know, sinner or sin, you know, like these things that make people just think of them in very like rigid ways. But really it's like, how have I hurt myself? How did I act in a way that did not serve my higher self? How did I act in a way that did not serve my growth, my holistic growth? 
my spiritual growth, my mental growth, my emotional growth, because everything we do impacts us on, in, on all levels. But people don't want to talk about that. <laughs> talk about how behaviors affect our mental health. No, no, stay away from that. Just tell me, just want to talk about my anxiety and my, you know, just don't, but don't tell me how my behaviors affect that. But we know from even a psychological point of view that there are many factors that contribute to our mental health. When we look at even one disorder, we say it's, we have a multifactorial approach. We know that it could be genetics. We know that it could be biological. We know it could be, so, so um, environment can play a, a role, right? But then we don't want to talk about the spiritual. <laughs> no, everything we do impacts us. So when we go back to your question, we go through tests in life, I think it's just better to spend our energy asking different questions. Ya Allah, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to gain from this? Help me gain it, you know, things like that. As you said earlier, sometimes you need to understand sleep to appreciate uh -huh. being awake. Yeah, um, exactly. We I wouldn't un underappreciate good times without times of um, times of hardship. Yeah. And like sometimes, like I had this answer where they said, uh, if your hardship is making you that closer to Allah, exactly. Yeah. It's not Allah. It's not Allah. Yeah, exactly. So you look at where you're at, you know. What, what, how is, what is the hardship doing for you? Is it contributing to your growth? Is it contributing to your, um, you know, your relationship with Allah? And that's the thing. When we ask different questions, we gain different perspectives. If you're asking, why me? You're already placing yourself in a, in a, as a, in a position to be a receiver of harm. But if you ask, what is God teaching me? You're putting yourself in a position of, I'm a receiver of good. Right? What is Allah giving me? What is Allah teaching me? What does He have to offer me? So the first question, let me do that for him. I might ask you to repeat the second question. <laughs> the first question is how do we increase in self-awareness, right? Yeah, and decrease entitlement. And decrease entitlement, yeah. So I mentioned entitlement earlier and how there's a lot of harms to that. Um, I think everything in our faith is programmed to teach us to be more aware of ourselves. I mean, everything, you know, is about muhasaba and holding ourselves to account. Even just the concept of, you know, ihsan and, and, and being aware of what you're doing as you know that Allah sees you, right? Um, I think that it goes back to this verse of when we forget Allah, He makes us forget ourselves. When you remember Allah, He unveils your heart to see what you need to see. And this is why dhikr is so important, you know, increasing in dhikr and, and constantly connecting this heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He unveils the heart to see what you need to see about the world, about Him, but also about yourself. And we don't need to know everything about ourselves. This is a common misconception. People think, oh, I need to, you know, I need to know this and know that. Who said that? <laughs> you don't need to know everything about yourself. You only need to know what serves you. You're, on, you're, on, you're in this world for only a short time. You know, I remember I met somebody who, um, you know, she it was a, one, of, one of the teachers in my doctoral program. And she said she was, she, was a, she specialized in psychoanalysis. And I asked her, you know, um, how long have you been, she was also in psychoanalysis and she was sharing this. And I said, how long have you been doing this? And she said, 10 years and I'm still, you know, going. I said, wow, you know, psychoanalysis is pretty deep. And, you know, and, and I said, wow, you know, so you've been in, in it for 10 years and what makes you continue? She's like, there's always another, you know, something I to discover about myself that I have to work on. And while I think that's true, I think that we have to be careful too, because like, and this is why we ask Allah, Oh Allah, I ask you for knowledge that benefits and I seek refuge in you from knowledge that does not benefit. That also applies to ourselves. <laughs> I, I don't want to know knowledge about myself that's not going to benefit me. <laughs> right? Because we think, oh, all self-awareness. Wow, I discovered something new about myself. Okay, that's great. How does that help you? <laughs> you know? How does that serve you? Does that even benefit you? Does that help you? Does that make you grow on a spiritual level, mental, emotional? Does that serve your akhirah? You know? 
So that's also important. So when, so that's a good way to also start. Is, ya Allah, like, show me what I need to know about myself. And you know, I, and I seek refuge in you from knowledge about myself that won't help me. <laughs> you know? So that's where we start. To reduce entitlement, we need work on the nafs. You know, because the reason why we're so entitled in our world is because we're leading with the nafs. The more you lead from your nafs, the more entitled you're going to be. Because the nafs is like a, like your this child is throwing a tantrum. Think about entitlement, right? What happens when someone entitled doesn't get what they want? They throw a tantrum, right? So it's it's taming this or being like a parent to the child, <laughs> saying no. Okay, you're agitated right now, like. You know, if you're in a line, little ways, I swear, it's little, I always say this is like the little things that like shift you. You know, let's say you're in the grocery, you're standing in a grocery line and it's getting long and you feel, you start, oh my gosh, why are they, you know, why are they so slow or why, you know, no, I'm not entitled to fast service all the time, you know, and, and you know what, this is an opportunity, I'll work on my nafs, you know, so just shh, your nafs, <laughs> like, you know, really, it's like, it's like taming or training or, t um, raising a child right it's like you know telling them okay listen we have to be patient we have to you know this is and it's those moments where you catch yourself like being agitated just because you have to wait <laughs> and with Allah which goes into your second question you know like when things happen and we think we're entitled a certain actually it's so interesting you asked this I was thinking about this as we were waiting for the elevator this morning downstairs and I people were complaining about like how slow the elevator was and I was thinking about like how I came into the building thinking just assuming that there was not going to be a line, right? <laughs> and I was like, wow, so, you know, just the concept, which led me then to reflect about how even the concept of fairness, that we think we're entitled to fairness all the time. <laughs> but who's, who, who promised us that? <laughs> who promised us that life is fair, right? That everything should be fair, that everything, you know? Of course, we should embody those things, but we shouldn't live in, assume or live in our world thinking that we're entitled to that. <laughs> if we receive it, alhamdulillah. If we don't receive it, then that's a test. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but... <laughs> yeah. I think it's related to that idea of time gratitude. Oh, yeah, the gratitude, yeah. 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 I think it's that same as an idea. How do you know that something you don't like is good for me? And it goes back to just our opinion of Allah, right? Like, if I know in my heart that He is the most loving and He, what He does for me is in service of who I am and what He's trying to mold within me. Like, if I really cultivate that belief, then, Ya Allah, I know that what you're doing is in service, is, 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 best, is best for me, right? And when you have that, like, I like to think of had Allah, like the concept of, when if Allah lifted the veils for me right now and showed me what he was doing for me what would I say you know and the thing is is that many of us are disconnected from al-ghaib like the fact that what is al-ghaib it's the unseen there are realities around us that are happening all the time that are unseen and because we're disconnected from that we all we see is our world <laughs> all we see is what is visible we don't see for example when you know we remember Allah and the angels come and join us we don't see that we don't see the angels writing our good deeds. We don't see that, right? So our disconnect from these realities also makes us really only believe that what is visible is our only reality, when it isn't. If God lifted the veils and showed you what he was doing for you, you wouldn't even speak. You'd be in awe. So it's in those moments where you you know, redefine or renew your perspective of, of your creator and say, well, Allah only does what is in service of me. And I always like to, and I mentioned this verse before, the verse um, in uh, Surah Taha where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he tells Musa alayhi salam of all the things that, you know, he all his favors upon him, you know, that, you know, after he, he um, Pharaoh took him, right, how he returned him to his mother and all of these things, then he says, And I have bestowed upon you love from me, so that you may be molded or you may be raised under my eye. So what is that essentially? It's that two things. All of these things that you went through were part of your molding, but not molding under any human being, you're molded under the greatest, right? 
but also that your, your, everything you went through is rooted in my love for you. And we can understand this when we look at the parent-child relationship, you know, like in the child's limited mind, right? They think if their parent took their toy, you know, who are we to say that's not a big deal? No, to them it's a big deal. It could be the equivalent of us when we don't get something we want from God, <laughs> right? But to them it's like, you know, and you see kids like, oh, I hate you. you get throwing tantrums like their parents are evil just because they didn't give them something they wanted. And that very thing could be harmful to them. You know, you see parents pulling their kids away from touching something hot and the kid's crying, like, so mad that, like, how, how could you, like, pull me away from that, right? But that's how we are with Allah, and that's how Allah is with us. He's so loving, and so when He withholds, when He gives you, it's all in service of who you are and who He's trying to mold you. So I think renewing and working on our opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really important. Okay, I, we're a little over. Yeah. Well, well, I don't see him. Is Imam Khaled here, or do we have time? Okay, we'll take one more question. Yeah. Cool. Um, the topic about the nafs uh, comes up through my uh, circle of uh, suhba. Mm -hmm. And trying to, I mean, I feel like many imams and shio kind of, I don't know if they're mixing up the meanings, knowing the difference between the nafs and the roh. Because uh, we've been, I've been studying uh, jihad and nafs. Mm -hmm. and the struggle of the self. Yeah. yeah and trying, to, you know, through, again, the circle and trying to figure out um, the best way on, you know, to, what would you say, I kind of lost my train of thought. It's okay. Um, oh, it's role in psychology. Like, would that be considered the ego mm -hmm. in psychology? But mm -hmm. what is it also considered in the ghaib? Like, what is the mm -hmm. nafs in the ghaib? and how do we overcome these challenges and mm -hmm. taking control of it so yeah so this is like a more <laughs> it's deep yeah, it's, it's, I know. yeah so i actually do teach this um many of you are familiar with um my heart over mind and ego method and i break break down this it's an islamic psychological approach to understanding ourselves and i the reason i developed the method and actually alhamdulillah my book on it is coming out soon so inshallah should be uh, available publicly um within the next two weeks but i do actually break this down but i the reason why I developed this method is because I do feel like there's a lot of confusion around these entities and then we don't know how to interact with them. So the reason well, I wanted to create a model that kind of showed people, okay, well, just for your own, because I'm, I'm really about learning what you need to interact with. Sometimes we get too caught up in the theoretical, okay, yeah, we can sit here and talk for hours about like all the different, by the way, there's several stages of the nafs that the scholars, right, you know, but there are three main ones that we say, and, and, and the thing is, linguistically, because nafs is used interchangeably sometimes, and sometimes scholars don't take time to explain or like, or say, okay, I'm talking about this part of ourselves, right, people get confused, and they say, well, is this my soul, is this my, but when I, when I, for my purposes, when I say nafs, I'm talking about our lower self. And I'm talking about the part of us that's driven by desires and pleasure and comfort, right? And when we say, um, and when I when I mention soul, I'm just referring to that most permanent part of you, actually who you are, which is the part of you that transcends this human experience. It's not the nafs. The nafs dies in this world, by the way, right? Your nafs does not go beyond this world, right? So only the ruha goes beyond this world and so sometimes that is used interchangeably with nafs and mutmainna the tranquil right because then we've reached that alignment with with who we are as a, at a soul level right so it is it is um there's so many levels to this but the important thing to know is that you have a part within you that is is part of this human experience and it is this lower self because we are in the lower world <laughs> dunya is the lower world it's not the higher world and so when you when we use nafs we're, we're referring to that part of us that is attached to this dunya that we have to work on taming so that we can elevate to our higher self we can elevate to be who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be and as as we go on with the series i'll probably introduce some of these concepts inshallah inshallah okay okay we'll wrap up here Allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa alihi wa ashabi ajma'in and i'll see you guys next week inshallah um every wednesday at 6 p.m We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah.
السلام عليكم